Tonight on Talking Politics, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu says she's confident that her new approach to mass and cast, including the city's new tent ban, will work in the long run. But are there unintended consequences for the people who used to live there? GBH's Tori Bedford put those questions to the mayor. She'll join me ahead with the answers and the context behind that story. Plus, Massachusetts Republicans have flipped a state Senate seat the Democrats held for decades. What does it mean for the future of the state GOP? But first, it is hard to overstate the scale of the human loss in Gaza, where Israel has killed thousands of Palestinians in retaliation for the October Hamas attack, which killed more than 1,400 Israelis. The Gaza Health Ministry, which is run by Hamas, puts the death toll at more than 11,000 people, and the UN has called Gaza a, quote, graveyard for children. Many journalists have also been caught in the crosshairs. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, at least 39 media members have been killed, marking the deadliest month for journalists since the group started collecting data in 1992. Israeli officials have said they can't guarantee the safety of any journalists in the Gaza Strip unless they embed with its own military. But that comes with a serious trade-off. Journalists embedded with the IDF in Gaza operate under the observation of Israeli commanders in the field and are not permitted to move unaccompanied within the Strip. As a condition to enter Gaza under IDF escort, outlets have to submit all materials and footage to the Israeli military for prior uh, review, prior to publication. I tell you this because CNN has agreed to these terms in order to provide you the viewers a limited window into Israel's operations in Gaza. I'm joined now by former CNN White House correspondent Dan Lothian. He's now the executive producer of GBH and PRX's The World radio show. And Susie Banakaram, host of the new podcast In Retrospect with Susie Banakaram and Jessica Bennett. Thank you both for being here. So Susie, it's not just CNN. ABC has agreed to these terms as well. NBC, possibly some other media outlets that I'm not aware of. Uh, do you believe that agreeing to embed with the IDF and share your raw footage is an appropriate trade-off to make in return for the ability to cover the biggest story in the world right now. Yeah, I mean, these are really complicated decisions. And I think if it is a part of your coverage, if one of the things or one of the ways in which you're covering this conflict is to embed and you disclose it in this way, that it is a tool that you should have in the arsenal, I think the danger here is the danger that um, was often cited during the Iraq war embeds, which is often if you are embedded with the military, you are going to start to just naturally by being with them, take on a sort of military point of view. I think at the time, Gay Talese said something like, you know, the danger here is that they become mascots for the military. And it's a little more complicated even, I think, in the Israel-Palestine conflict because we are really struggling to get any information out of Gaza that is not filtered through the Israeli government, right? I mean, of those 39 journalists that have been killed, 34 of them have been Palestinian. I think that's an important thing to note. So independent journalists in Gaza are far and few between. They are literally struggling to survive as they cover the conflict. And, you know, I, I think in this case, the fact that the only way Israel is letting any foreign journalists in to see for themselves this conflict does represent, as the military often calls this, a sort of information dominance that does skew the picture in ways that aren't great, to be I, honest. I hadn't heard that phrase, but that seems very apt. Dan Lothian, if one of your correspondents got an offer you know, come in bed with us, just make sure you share any audio, video that you get before you go to broadcast. What would you do? How would you respond? Well, first of all, now on this side of the aisle, the first conversation I would have about, it would be about safety. Right? You're always concerned if you're going into a situation like that, is it safe? Uh, what are your chances of getting out, even if you're going along with the milita military? Um, you know, th this is the kind of assignment that, um, absent of any other access, you have to say yes to it, right? Um, the key, though, is making sure that you are transparent with the audience. Um, one of the big criticisms always is, you know, we didn't know that this, these were the guidelines and these were the rules mm -hmm. when you showed us this report. So I think what you've seen from CNN and the lead-in to these pieces is where they laid out and they'll say, 
say, this is what we have to show them, this is what we have to do, and this is what we don't do. And so we have full editorial control over the final product. The other thing I would say, there is a distinction between what we're seeing here, which is really forays in, in and out. Uh, kinds of situation. Yes, you're embedded, but you know, I, I don't foresee that this is going to be extended the way that we saw um, during past uh, embeds with U.S. troops, where you were in for the long haul. Mm -hmm. You were going along, you were sleeping there, you were eating with them, you were in a tank with them. And so that is the danger of you're so close to the sources, you're reporting on them on a daily basis. You're also, I remember one reporter telling me that I was always a little nervous about what I I was how hard I was going to hit them, knowing that they were watching my back, and so we're humans. Yeah, at the that's end of the an day. incredible thing to have to weigh. Exactly, they're protect. They're there and allowing you to go along for a reason. It isn't safe, and they're going to provide somewhat of a circle of security mm -hmm. around you. So that's in the back of your mind when you're out there as you're making these editorial decisions. Yeah, it would have to be. Yeah. I want to roll a, a bite from Ian Pinnell, who's reporting for ABC News, which. I think, uh, or, forgive me, not a bite, but a quote <laughs> from Ian Pinnell. Uh, I want to just show the way he describes some of what he saw as he was embedded. Uh, and I think we can pull that up right now. Ian Pinnell wrote, it is a scene of utter devastation. Building after building is scarred and blackened by the bombardment. Nowhere is safe, the deputy commander tells me. A veteran of past wars, he says, this time has to be different, that Hamas cannot be allowed to attack Israel again. I asked him about the huge civilian death toll, and he insisted the IDF is doing all it can to minimize casualties. The devastation all around suggests a less cautious approach. And I wanted to roll that because, Dan and Susie, it seems to me that that shows that there is at least the capacity to maintain a semblance of independence and critical detachment, even if you're operating under these conditions. Is that a fair conclusion to draw from that and, you know, the work of other journalists? Susie, why don't you go first and then? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair. And obviously these are all seasoned journalists. You're not sending anyone into an embed that hasn't dealt with these issues before. I mean, these are, you know, assignments we give to the most seasoned reporters, right? Mm -hmm. So I think Sure, I, there will be some ability to maintain this independence, but I think the question is kind of a larger question of are you being used as a pro propaganda tool, right? Yep. Like you're only seeing what they're allowing you to see. You're only showing what they're allowing you to show. So again, I think this is an important tool. You do have to send reporters on these embeds, but I think you have to also be really careful about how much you're really able to be objective in a scenario where just what you're seeing is being limited, right? There isn't a real and full picture being presented to you. You're only getting access to information they're willing to give you access to. And what concerns me in a situation like this with Ian is if this is the information he's being access to, if give, this is the information yeah, he's yeah. being given access to, what's the information he's not being given access to? Do you know what I mean? I do. I do. Dan, am I maybe getting ahead of myself in terms of that Pinnell quote saying that shows it can work out okay? No, look, I, I, I think that... Um, you, you can argue about what you're not seeing um, because of the, the the restrictions that you have, but you're seeing something that you weren't seeing before, right? So you are getting some access mm -hmm. and you're able to um, either to uh, support some of the, the narratives that we've heard out there or cast a different light on those narratives. One thing I'll say, you know, for, for viewers who are, are just now paying attention to this issue, again, as we've talked about, this came up during, you know, I remember when embeds first started, like that was a thing. There were different versions of it, but the way that it ended up being in um, with David Bloom, for example, if we recall, when he went in the Bloommobile and spent all that time, I remember there were a lot of conversations around the independence of the information, right? And I, I don't think that anyone felt that this was the perfect way to cover a war or a conflict. Um, but it is, um, it, it can be that tool, right? It gets you closer than you can get from the outside and having to rely either on locals to give you information or um, just on visuals military that you're able video, to, yeah. yeah, and military video. I want to switch gears a little bit. An outlet called The Honest Report, a pro-Israeli uh, web entity, accused freelancers of working, uh, uh, forgive me, accused freelancers who are working with some big, Western news outlets of possibly having foreknowledge 
of the attack on Israel. They tweeted out a photo of one of these freelancers, Hassan Aslaya, uh, posing with a Hamas leader. You can see it right there. Um, AP and CNN have severed ties with Eslaya. They've also stressed that they had no advanced knowledge of the attack on Israel. The New York Times and Reuters have also said they have no advanced knowledge or had no advanced knowledge of the attack on Israel. Susie, if one or more of the freelancers singled out by the Honest Report did know that the attack on Israel was going to happen, does it end up reflecting badly on their employers or does it not? So I think this is complicated. These are freelancers, so they are not their employees. These are not, you know, you're not an employer when you reach out to a freelancer after something's happened. To I shouldn't have used friend. the word employers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's complicated. I mean, certainly there's an obligation, but I don't think, I, I think I can say with almost 100% certainty, no American media outlet was aware yep. of these attacks before they happened. I think it's an incredibly irresponsible claim. It puts journalists all over the world at risk when you claim things like this. And it's, you know, part of the reason I think it's dangerous to be embedded with the IDF. The, the IDF has supported this claim and has been repeating it, even though it knows that despite the fact that this outlet is called honest reporting, they haven't actually claimed any reporting in this scenario. They have just made this accusation without any evidence. And so, Sure, if they have found that these freelancers were in fact aware of the attacks or complicit in them, that is a real ethical concern. I don't think that is likely the case. And, you know, what's interesting about this photograph you show is that it does seem really incendiary, right? You're like, look at this photographer, yes, he's with yeah. the Hamas leader. But that Hamas leader at that time was part of the government of Palestine. Now, the Palestinian people may not feel that he represents them because you know, Hamas has not allowed elections in many years. Right. But at the time of that photograph, the Hamas leader was a government official and that photographer was working with him, much like these embeds, right? So these are complicated relationships. We do need access. And if you're a Palestinian reporter, you are regularly communicating with Hamas leaders, whether or not, you know, you are aware or complicit in their attacks is a different conversation. But I don't think the picture itself is necessary uh, evidence that this was, you know, a, 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 an evidence attack of that the knowledge. photographer yeah. was part of, right? I mean, that's just a really big accusation. Right. Dan, as Susie mentioned, the Israeli government has amplified this claim. Benny Gantz tweeted something along the lines of, if there were any journalists who knew this was going to happen and they didn't sound an alarm bell, they're equivalent to terrorists and should be treated as such. People have argued that that type of rhetoric ramps up the danger that oh, journalists face. It really does. I mean, it, and, and what we see, it's the information war that happens alongside with the real war, right, across social media where uh, various sides, and it's not just in this conflict, but you see this um, across society in general, where you will, if you find even a kernel of something that is connected potentially to truth, <laughs> you blow it up to use it to um, your advantage, that's right? Your advantage. And so that, that's what you're seeing in a situation like this. Um, I do want to wind back just a little bit, though, to just kind of give a little bit more context. Look, news organizations cannot do their work without locals on the ground, um, whether they're freelance photographers, whether they're fixers, whether they're producers, we use them all the time. Um, by virtue of the fact that they are local and that they live in those areas and those communities, they have family members, they have friends, they have sources, right? Now, I don't know everything that happened in, in this particular case behind the scenes, but often what will happen is someone's connected to someone, they'll say, hey, something's going down tonight. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you know what exactly is going down, you position yourself to be able to capture whatever is going down. It's possible that that's something that could have happened here. But, you know, this, this is how we operate. And then what we have to do as responsible journalists and executives in, in news organizations is to vet the people and have constant communication with them about who do they know, what do they know, um, who are they around. Um, we, when we bring on new fixers or producers on the ground, it's a lot of vetting through people who've worked with them. That's a know, heavy responsibility. And it is a, exactly. Yeah. But you uh, have to do it. It's important. Dan Lothian, Susie Banakaram, thank you both for talking this tricky stuff through. Thank you.
More than a week after the city cleared tents from Mass and Cass, enforcing a new citywide ban on encampments, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu says she's optimistic about her administration's efforts to address the crises of homelessness and addiction in that area. We feel very confident that this is an approach that we'll be able to sustain over the long run. Unlike after past sweeps of Mass and Cass, the mayor told GBH News' Tory Bedford on Greater Boston that they haven't yet seen a new wave of tents pop up across the city. The mayor and her coordinated response director, Tanya Del Rio, also said they were able to find temporary housing for more than 100 people who'd been living in the area. But what about people who didn't end up with a place to stay? And what about the role of law enforcement in all of this? Tory Bedford joins me now. Tori, you've covered Mass and Cass for a long time. You've covered previous clearances. Was there something fundamentally different about this one? And if so, what was it? So because of this ordinance, which is a law, the city previously was required to give people 48 hours notice if they were to take down someone's tent. And now police can go in under threat of arrest and have someone take their tent down. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the main difference. I think in, in where we're at in, this, in the state, there's just significantly less shelter and there's fewer shelter options and people were moved into shelter. Many people, as you mentioned, were moved into th low threshold housing, but I think previously the focus was maybe more on housing and now there's a little more focus on shelter. Am I right? What, what's uh, differentiate between housing and shelter? Because I think of them as the same. So a lot of people think of them as the same and I think that that is kind of one of the issues with all of these, these clearings as they happen is that low threshold housing is a room that is yours and you have a key and a door and you might be able, low threshold just means that if you are someone who is currently using drugs that you're allowed to continue to do so mm -hmm. without having to go through detox in order to kind of earn that housing and, mm -hmm. and shelter is usually a congregate shelter setting not always congregate but a shelter setting where you're living maybe with multiple people and you know you have the bed maybe you have an agreement where you have the bed but you might just have it for a night right and people tend to stay less time in shelter mm -hmm. okay and in this case it was about 70 people put in low threshold housing yeah, right 73 and 30 give or take put in a shelter situation? Yeah, and some people were given specific, they worked with individuals to find specific shelter situations that were most like best suited to them. Like there were some younger people, there were people who needed special accommodations, so there's yeah, a range. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I know advocates who are opposed to clearances like this in Boston, but across the country, warn that there are public health consequences when they occur. What are the concerns that people have about this type of approach? So there are, there's so, there's a huge body of research about the impact of clearing tents and of police intervention and incarceration, involuntary commitment, involuntary rehabilitation for people. So much has been studied and researched about this to the point where, you know, we've been doing this in Boston for so long that there have been studies that have come out from previous clearings here, mm -hmm. including Operation Clean Sweep, which was one in 2019 that former Mayor Marty Walsh conducted. And what, what are just, what, what are the, some, some of the biggest yeah, negative Their concerns are just that people tend to overdose, that the overdose death rate uh, heightens, that people are displaced and they, you know, it's harder to find people, it's so harder. Maybe aren't connected with healthcare providers, for example. Right, and I spoke to a psychologist there who had worked with folks down there, she works at MGH, and she was saying that she's concerned that, you know, some people will be placed in low threshold housing, those people will hopefully be able to be moved through programs and access resources, but other people who maybe have previous warrants or were placed in shelter, they might just get on the train and just keep going and, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the on-ramp off of Copley near Back Bay Station is like, there are people living under bridges now, there are people hiding out, there are people moving to different areas, and those people will be harder to find. That's really interesting, and it makes me wonder, is there speculation that this clearance, this focus on Mass and Cass, is simply going to end up dispersing that population throughout the city rather than having them concentrated there? So the mayor has emphasized that enforcement will be happening throughout the entire city. She sent out outreach teams, there's additional police presence, and they are trying to crack down on encampments. One thing that's really interesting that's come up is that they'll, they will need to involve state police on DCR property, on, on mm -hmm. parks property, on any kind of state park. So some of the encampments that have actually come up there have been brought up and were brought up in city council sessions about the ordinance because that, actually enforcing that, you know, and there, there's a jurisdi jurisdictional, jurisdictional issue that they'll need right. to figure out. I want to roll a bite from your interview with Mayor where she talks about this central booking system that was implemented in connection with this clearance. Let's take a look. We have actually implemented a central booking 
rather than being held in the individual police precinct closest to where they were taken into, a cust into custody, where our um, precincts aren't set up with food or medical care or, or really, you know, arrangements for that. Folks are um, taken now to Suffolk County, uh, Nashua, or, sorry, not Nashua Street, um, taken to the House of Corrections. So there you have the mayor casting central booking as the sort of holistic, maybe more accommodating approach, but not everyone likes the idea of it, right? It's highly controversial and it's the legality, I think, is questionable. I'm not sure about all of the specifics of that, but, you know, it has been proposed uh, in every legislative session and it has not yet passed mm. as something that the sheriff can do. So they have an arrangement um, to bring people in. People are being held pre-arraignment. So, you know, they haven't gone through the precinct. They don't necessarily maybe have the resources to know what their bail might be. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. It, it, I think the point is to be able to give people medical resources and to be able to, you know, give people help that they need because this is a very vulnerable population. But it's highly controversial. And it's not something that's been previously publicized as a part of this ordinance. I, she also mentioned that no arrests have been made in connection to the ordinance, and she, I think, meant that people have not refused to take down their tents and been arrested because of that. Mm -hmm. But the ordinance language actually specifies that any kind of public disturbance, drinking, swearing, anything, you can be arrested without a warrant and brought in pre-arraignment into the central booking system. Well, have there been arrests made not for refusing to take down a tent, but for other things? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've reached out to the police department several days ago, several times, the sheriff, the DA. Um, I've asked the jails about it. And I would think it would be highly unusual that in that entire area, no arrests have occurred because the police said that they would increase enforcement with the increased presence. And they mentioned people who were preying on other people. They also said that that differentiation is made on a case by case basis. But I don't I can't mean, say I, definitively. I can't. Okay. I don't know. All right. You always have me on here saying, I don't know. Ambiguity is good. You're to not supposed to do so. that on TV. No, 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 no. It's, it's good to know, but what I don't know, know and what we don't know. I don't All right. Know. All right. Terry Bedford, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Among the many city and town elections on Tuesday, there was an outlier, a special election for state senate in Central Mass, where voters flipped the Worcester-Hampshire district seat long held by Democrats. Republican Peter Durant, a current state rep, won the race by five points on a platform of gun rights and criticism of Governor Maura Healey's response to the state's migrant shelter crisis. So how did he turn the district red? And what, if anything, does it mean for Massachusetts Republicans heading into 2024? GBH News State House reporter Katie Lannon was at Durant's headquarters on election night, and she joins me now. Good to see you, Katie. Good to see you. So now. this is just one election. Republicans are still very much in the minority at the State House. But I had the impression from your coverage that people on both sides were really invested in this. Lieutenant Governor Driscoll was out campaigning for John Zlotnick. The Democrats, Scott Brown, and the diplomats were rocking out, trying to get people pumped up to vote for Durant. What did Karen Polito say? The most important thing in the world is that you go out and knock on doors or cast of something like that. Something of that effect. Yeah, yeah. So why the intense investment in one race when the disparity is so great? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's worth noting too that in in many ways this has always been, or at least in recent memory, been a red district. They went for many of the towns in this district went for Jeff Deal over Maura Healy. And the weird for Massachusetts, weirdly competitive nature, the weirdly purple nature of this district made the stakes higher for a lot of people because, you know, I think the Republicans were really looking for a win here to kind of start a new narrative after they were shut out from statewide electorate office yep. last year. And I think the, the Democrats didn't want to give up any ground on that. They want to keep that streak going. And we saw, you know, abortion access being invoked on oh, the Democratic side um, with the organizations highlighting the, the Democrat, John Zlotnick, his votes in the House for abortion access measures and Peter Durant's votes against them. So I think that the Democrats have really, you know, they don't want to give up any ground. And the Republicans, I think, are really looking to use this to to start something, even though, as you say, it gives the, the Senate uh, minority caucus four, will grow right? to four from three. You know, when you mention the, uh, the issue of abortion, it seems to me like that might be kind of a tough sell when the status quo is as entrenched as it is here, right? If you're warning that Peter Durant is 
not going to protect abortion access. People who are hearing that warning know that Republicans don't have any critical mass to make changes there. Right. right. The, the Democrats have a supermajority in the Senate and will continue to do so. They would have to lose a lot more seats to put that at risk. So is there a sense among the Republicans that you talk to that Durant's approach, talking about uh, the migrant crisis, the shelter system, gun rights, that this is a playbook that they could use in other districts to, you know, get a little more robust representation on Beacon Hill? Definitely. I think people I talked to were really watching to see, you know, I talked to State Senator Ryan Fatman, who's a Republican from Central Mass as well, and he said that if Peter Durant wins, that's a referendum on those two issues, you know, that those mm. are can be winning issues for the party. Um, I talked to some other folks who say that, like, you know, he's focusing, too, on economic issues, the cost of housing, cost of living, the economy. And those are bread and butter, bread and butter issues for Republicans in some cases. And I think there is an interest that they can, Republican candidates can kind of find their own uh, way into this playbook and, mm -hmm. and maybe have success in the future. And it's worth noting, this is a nice boost for Amy Carnevale too, right? The new head of the party who has pledged to try to bring together the sort of pro-Trump and pro-Baker factions that were at loggerheads uh, under her predecessor. This is a, a a good thing for her. Yeah, and they made a point, too, of, of having unity events with uh, Bruce Chester, who Peter Durant beat out in the primary. They, they really, I have repeatedly had been hearing the phrase, rowing in the same direction. I think Republicans hmm. really want to show that, look, we did come together behind a candidate. We're ready to put the infighting behind us, and when we come together, we can win. So I remember seeing a quote from Steve Kerrigan, the chair of the Mass Democratic Party, saying that the party was all in on this race and that it was really important. How are Democrats explaining away the loss? I think they're, they're pointing to the dynamics of the district, right? And I, I think you're hearing still that it's, you know, it is one seat that doesn't, you know, it'll certainly give the Republicans another member a little bit more uh, voice in the Senate, mm -hmm. but it's... We still have a Democratic supermajority. We still have a Democratic governor, all Democrats in the constitutional offices and in Congress. I, I don't think that you're going to hear Democrats making too much of this one race on the other side. So unless we start to see multiple Republican victories, right. uh, maybe not. And I think you'll probably see Democrats make another play at this seat next year. Um, because this was a special right. election. All the seats in the legislature are up for grabs again next year, including this Good one. reminder. All right, Katie Lannon, good to see you. Good to talk to you as always. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. That'll do it for tonight, but do come back next week and please tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. And while you're at it, sign up for our politics newsletter. For now, thank you for watching and good night.